You're listening to The College Light Bulb, presented by The Coaching Educator, where we illuminate your college path. Here's your host, Rebecca M. Carroll. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited because I work with athletes and I've got an athlete, plus now he's in the business. Can you introduce yourself? Seth Condor, I work for Treasure Valley Strength and Conditioning. Uh, I work with everyone from teenagers down to 65-year-old. Yeah. yeah, so even you, you would oh. qualify, Rebecca. So, um, <laughs> But the idea is I see, you know, kind of uh, anyone needs to be physically active. I'm a big believer in physical activity for life. Um, but I'm trying to break through into kind of some underserved populations yeah. uh, with the sport world. So right now I'm kind of pushing into volleyball. I didn't realize um, how locally how popular that is you know these big clubs have four or five hundred girls uh and there's just really no programs that are feeding them and really it's in a lot of injury i mean i just find with strength training well i met seth uh at a networking group and i because i'm an educator and i work with athletes uh, on the other end of it and helping them understand the the admissions process and the recruiting process I have never worked with an athlete that has been in the shape they need to be in for where they want to play, where their heart is set. Um, So I have come across um, a lot of people who claim to be able to um, coach you, but you actually, after speaking with him for, I don't know, we were in the parking lot after for about 20 minutes, I knew that this guy is the real deal and why? What is, what's the difference between you and what you do at Treasure Valley, um, strength and conditioning? What is the difference between what you do and what, and what athletes need? Like, what is the key to why you are as successful as you are? I mean, are you a former athlete? <laughs> yeah, so I am a local guy. I played at Eagle High School, actually. Oh, you are? Yeah. I didn't realize you were from this area. Okay. Yeah, so Eagle High grad, class of 2009. So, yeah, a lot of, uh, really, that's what set the precedent for really all of this. I had a great mentor, started weightlifting at 14. Mm-hmm. Um, he had personally had a really good track record. I mean, I was one of 10 guys in my grade that was squatting over 400 pounds as a senior in high school. Wow. So he, and I like that you used mentor because that actually was my research, and that's supposed to be one of the key indicators of success is if you have a mentor in high school. So what did this mentor tell you to do? Because you were lifting weights, which I find a lot of a lot of coaches are concerned about that in some sports. They think that lifting weights is going to make them slower and bulk them up so they won't be able to move. Do you think that's true? Oh, not at all. There's a big perceived risk of, oh, if I put a barbell on your back, magically you're going to just crumple underneath it and you're going to have a lumbar disc issue, knees, hips, just everything is going to go um, out the window. But really, as long as you know proper movement and mechanics are um, taken into account, there's really not really any issue there um, because proper mechanics will guide how much weight can be used by the athlete because you're not going to push them beyond what they should mechanically do. Yeah. So, and then with, you know, guys, there's kind of this macho, hey, let's just throw weights around. And a lot of times numbers are just that. They aren't really um, true to form or there's not really integrity to it. Mm -hmm. And then what we see with the females is they really do the quite opposite. They just run away from the weight room. So the female who wants to come in and really enjoys the lifting Um, on their own is very few and far between, but I've found that if you make the right introduction for the female, they can really um, gain the most from that because they're underserved. No one really wants to work with them because it's viewed of a, if you're not the football, the basketball, those top tier sports, then Mm -hmm. there's really no value in working with you because you're just this lesser sport. And that's kind of been, you know, perceived, you know, with, with, with sports and broadly in society, you know, football is kind of king and then basketball. Mm-hmm. And then it kind of just slowly goes downhill from there. Oh, yeah. I mean, believe me, I'm from that generation. So I get it. I mean, there were sports that we couldn't even do. We weren't allowed to do. So I always ask three questions on my podcast. So where, I, where my podcast is the college light bulb, as the announcement made. And so we just like to illuminate 
kind of the path because what I am finding is that a lot of students think they absolutely know what they have to do and many don't. Some are lucky enough to know. Some learn along the journey. Um, I like to know, so what was your educational path? So you were an Eagle High graduate. Correct. So then what? I uh, went on to Linfield College in uh, Willamette Valley, okay. just there south of Portland. So play, uh, played football for two years. Um, there. Did you go there strategically so that you would have play time? Was uh, it for the purpose of recruiting? Were you looking to get recruited or you? The, the honest truth is coming out of high school or going into my senior year, I was just like, this is going to be it. I'm done. I'm over. Really? And then, and then uh, the way the season ended left a sour taste in my mouth and wasn't how I wanted to kind of finish football. We went to the state championship game. We're undefeated and then just got absolutely smashed in the state championship game. Was that shocking? Do you think you approached, do you, do you think the team was overconfident or do you just think it was all a matter of the other team just played better at that There day? was one really big unfortunate event in the semifinal game prior to the state championship game. So our oh. future um, Arizona State uh, uh, grad, or he went to Arizona State, our quarterback, Taylor, um, just got his femur just obliterated <gasps> the game before. So, oh, my gosh. So we lost our kind of star of our team, and we went, turned one-dimensional, really, because yeah. we had one game to kind of figure it out and didn't really go well. So Yeah. Well, so uh, was so then you you didn't want to leave it in that way. And what did your mentor, was he involved with helping you get to this college and consider going to school? Did you know what you wanted to study? Yeah, I had a good idea. I um, he also was influential in where, where I wanted to go and or position myself school-wise. So I wanted to be a teacher of some regard. I didn't know what subject, but mm -hmm. I was drawn to the fitness side of stuff. So uh, I ended up being a PE major. Okay. And so that really helped uh, narrow down because the school I wanted to go kind of had to have, hey, I want to have a good education program. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Linfield, uh, their big kind of claim to fame is that they have the longest um, consecutive winning seasons uh, in a row. So they had a really good kind of culture in their program, which I was really drawn to. Mm -hmm. um, but then kind of sometimes those those things from the outside aren't the same from what they are on the inside. At least that was kind of my perception. And, you know, for someone who hasn't played college sports, there's a very different um, level and degree of not only commitment, but just atmosphere, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, from high school to college. Oh, I, I mean, that's one of the things I talk about is that you, when you're visiting schools that are potentially, um, that are potentially on the table for recruitment, they're either actively recruiting you or have invited you politely just to see how you do. You really need to, to, to be able to see these things. How much of a commitment um, are you, how much do you have to do for the college while you're there? There are some kids that only get to come home for Christmas you know, they fly in Christmas Eve, have Christmas, and they fly out the day after Christmas. Yeah, so that was kind of the big illuminator to me was in high school, f sports were an enjoyment to me. It was something I looked forward to, whereas in college, it becomes more of what I would call a job. I, it and, so you know, does, yeah. 2.30 to 9 was an average day during the football season. Yeah. And then, you know, you go from 9 to 1 or 2 at the library, and I wasn't going to go to college and just – be paying all that money just to kind of be sliding by. I mean, there was a marked difference between how I perform academically during season versus out of season. Mm -hmm. And I just think no matter where you skin it, uh, you can't really, that's a very hard act to balance. And so I just decided, Hey, it's time to kind of move on. And, you know, football, you know, especially I was in division three, this wasn't going to be a lifelong career. So I pivoted to towards school and that was kind of the, the way things worked out. So you played two years football. Correct. And then you, did you stay at that college? Yep, stayed there the whole four years. Okay, good. And so you you graduate with a PE degree. Did you do your year of working for nothing that they make you do as a, as a teacher? Because <laughs> I had to work for a year for nothing, you know, as an intern. They made uh, they. Did they? No, actually, I, I went right into private practice in terms of the fitness world. Oh, so uh, you... So I, it was one of the things where I was already into the degree. I also was maybe two or three classes short of an exercise science double major. Oh, nice. Um, 
And so I just, you know, kind of once football ended, I really enjoyed physical activity still and being active, lifting weights, doing those kind of things was a way to pursue that. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of just channeled the energy from the PE major, which, yeah, it's the private world, um, but in terms of, you know, private practice, but the the skills I learned as a, a teaching major, I would argue, are more invaluable than the knowledge base you need to have as a strength coach. Because I would agree. I'm in the business of teaching okay. is how I look at it. Well, and very different personalities who think differently and respond differently. And you have to get people, you know, from, you know, I work from as young as 13 to as old as 65. So you have to put something in the context of how they see it or look at it or use metaphor or analogy, which I mm -hmm. think are powerful tools to get someone to understand it. And, you know, the analogy you're going to use with a 13 year old is maybe talking about, you know, something more related to pop culture or something simpler. Whereas the analogy with someone older is talking about maybe life on the farm or something, you know, maybe a little, yeah. little uh, just a different kind of verbiage um, and language. Oh, I bet. I, that's really, I mean, I like that you feel you're using your degree. Yeah, a lot of people kind of, I think, at first I thought I wasted it. It's like, ah, oh, you know, I'm just, well, I'm not a teacher. Because I did do a little teaching, and I really enjoyed younger kids, like kindergarten to third grade, but just couldn't stand anything above that. That's funny, because uh, I, I mean, I took one contract job, it, and, and I, I, I did a great job, but it was K through, K through three, third grade. Ugh. Oh, see, I'm just a big kid, so. So I would rather work with teenagers. And, you know, I mean, I did it for the year, but I thought, I am not doing this again. And I, everybody loved me. The kids loved me. And I would get right on the floor with them and, you know, whatever, get outside and play on the playground. But it's much but different. Not... Working with athletes, they're more compelled and want to be there, as opposed to when you're working with sixth through ninth graders who despise physical activity. It just... Uh, it's like scratching nails on a chalkboard at times. So yeah, and you know, don't have any power of the paddle anymore or anything crazy like that. So <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, the uh, I one of the schools that I worked at, and I will not name names. The my office, which was the school counseling office, was a padded room, and that school almost got closed because they they used to use it. Then it was my office. A padded room. I'm not kidding. And I, I was thinking, what the heck? And I asked the school nurse who had been there for years. She's like, oh, yeah, this is, you look it up. They, uh, there was a lawsuit. Yeah, I mean. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, but, yeah, so I, th I really think that, really think, I mean, it, I, you could say that about any field, but I think yeah. there's a lack of teaching in most uh, environments or skills or trades, whatever they are. Whereas my job actually is to give people the tools so that they actually need me less. Yeah. In the sense that if I'm teaching and educating someone how to move or execute this lift or gain this or that ability, all of a sudden they're getting those clues and they can, you know, use those and figure things out and kind of be more problem solving based. Whereas not just be like, I've always got to be there and the hold your hand kind of mentality because right. there does need to be some kind of you know, Ownership. internal, internal, external balance of, you know, motivation, you know, knowledge, but also there needs to be some internal uh, drive, commitment, all those kind of things from the athlete themselves as well. Yeah. So you graduate from college and mm -hmm. you go into, so what did you go into? So I started, I got right into the, <laughs> right into the, the, oh gosh, the mouth of the beast here, CrossFit. Oh, so yeah. how do you feel about CrossFit now? I... You know, I got right into it, and so I was, you know, a little Kool-Aid drinking at first, so it tasted pretty good, you know. <laughs> you got to respect how well marketed that is. Yeah, it's, it's really... I don't see a lot of the injuries marketed after, because I, I think that's one of the biggest injury-producing programs ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think there's, there's good and bad. I think the good thing is that it's really brought a lot of attention to physical activity. Yes. And so I think that's a positive in the sense that now there's more people conscious of, hey, I need to take care of my body. And it also kind of got people more in tune with a certain type of training. It was more high intensity, mm -hmm. you know, got the barbell into more people's hands, which I think is a big, important aspect. But I was always at odds with certain things, you know, mainly you can imagine I'm about 220, so I never liked gymnastics. <laughs> so, you know, things like kipping pull-ups to me were always kind of, I was never really made sense 
um, handstand push-ups. You know, some of the high skill gymnastics, it's just the average person doesn't need to be able to get up on their a wall, drop their head aggressively to the floor and push themselves back up to be fit. Yeah. You know, um, so it was a good exposure is the way I would put it. I think it was a very helpful tool to help me learn and grow and see what was and wasn't successful in terms of how to prescribe movement to people. Um, but as a long-term fitness modality, I am very hesitant to recommend it to anyone anymore. Yeah. I think there's a place for it. Maybe, you know, it's usually an introduction for a lot of people to other avenues, but as a long-term modality, uh, I just don't see that being the best option. So you did you work as a coach for other people? And what got you here? You're back home to this area. Did yeah, so all, all of this. So when I graduated school, my first job I took at a CrossFit was actually in Eagle. So okay. I came, came back home. And then kind of circumstance took me to Seattle, kept doing it there. Then I, circumstance brought me back here. And then kind of the last uh, CrossFit I worked at just – kind of these things I've been feeling about it kind of had me at my wits end about being in that kind of system. So I was like, I've just got to be done. So I was like, I'm going to open up my own business. It's been something I've been throwing around for Mm -hmm. a while. And I think inherently within the fitness world, uh, each individual trainer has some strong systems or principles that they, you know, strongly push or use in their gym. And so, I, I and so, and so mine were different. Field. You know, yeah, yeah, it's mine, the same with me with school counseling. I, I I know I do it differently than other people. So mine were very convergent to CrossFit, and that kind of did cause some issues to some degree. So I just decided, hey, you know, I'm 28. It's time to get things going. And then mm-hmm. really the, the thing that got it all started is I got a good nagging from my wife. <laughs> so that it's time, she, you it's know, time, it's it was, time. It was really actually really supportive of her. She was like, I'm tired of hearing you complaining about this. You need to go open a business. You need to be either successful or fail. I don't really care which of those two happens, but stop talking about it and do it. Oh, what a great way to say it. Yeah. Because yeah, you're an so, action person. So, yeah, it was one of those things where, you know, I'd been chewing and chomping on this for years. And it's hard. Years. I but mean, bit, starting a business is not easy, especially a business where you have to bring people in. I, I, I'm in the same boat. I have to yeah. bring people in and transition people out and bring people in and... So that's um, so. How has the experience been so far? Your your where's your location? So I'm on Fairview Avenue down in Meridian, so the heart of heart of the valley. Fairview, just a little bit west of Eagle. Okay. So 2483 is the street number, and I've got about 3,000 square feet. Um, everything I need to get someone strong: barbells, kettlebells, dumbbells, pull-up bars, squat racks, uh, pretty much anything you need, we need in that department. And, you know, I, I'd be lying if I said that opening a business wasn't challenging. You know, I don't think anyone would ever say, like, oh, this is all butterflies and rainbows. It's shocking, um, some things. It's more so uh, not the acqu- challenge of ac- acquiring a member, but it's of uh, getting them to even come into the door. So once I can communicate with someone face-to-face, mm-hmm. I have a pretty high, I'm almost almost 70% success rate of getting someone to commit at least to a month yeah coming in but you know you get kind of a lot of this just give me more information you know and it's there's a lot of kind of it's tough because it feels like wasted time Mm -hmm. kind of giving these little requests and these things here and there Um, but you know who knows that person could turn around in two months and be like hey I tried that other option it was complete crap and now I want to try you out so I'm trying to not look at each opportunity as you know crap that kind of flew out the door uh, and then there's just the stress of, hey, are, are we on path, to, you know, because I have kind of a certain threshold of people in my gym to be profitable. And that's obviously, a, mm-hmm. you know, as a business owner, that's kind of the big yeah, moneymaker. And when you're, you know, you want to grow and you want to add some things that add to your particular program and then you're at that next level. So I've been in business 11 years and now I'm at a growth point. So it it was almost... I'm not going to say smooth sailing, but I had growth. You do your sales, but then there's these other things I wanted to add. And so now I'm at this level. And in order to bring it to where you want it to go, and it depends on where you want to go. I mean, Mm -hmm. I have never been wanting my business to be a one-man show or one-woman show. I like bringing in different aspects of it, but just marketing and everything else, getting the word out. It's nice that you're a local 
Yeah. It's nice that you actually are using your degree. So to me, you're using your degree. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And uh, it's also kind of to go to that point, I really enjoy the idea of getting to set the vision. You know, that, yeah. that was a big part that I really struggled with at other facilities that I work at is, you know, I wasn't, you know, maybe it's a little ego based, but you know, I wasn't guiding the ship. Yeah. And I always saw these opportunities. And now as a business owner, you still see those opportunities, but now you understand the inherent cost or time value or whatever, whatever the, the yeah. dynamic is associated with it. But, you know, that was one of the big things coming into this. I was like, well, hey, I want to really focus or keep my focus on you know, the adult population. And I, I still enjoy them, but I'm, what I'm really re- realizing is that, you know, kind of like we talked earlier, that there is certain athletic populations that are just being completely overlooked. Oh, and, and I get completely upset. So in my years as a school counselor, I was concerned. I've seen some real horror stories with athletes. So I do that educational piece and do the financial piece of colleges and pieces like that. I, I don't do the athletic piece. So it, it it's so good for me to align with people like you because then I can have you focusing on stuff that you need. I mean, I see athletes who are super bright, but they get hurt. And, or they, I mean, playing, and I don't know if you experienced this, but when you all of a sudden started playing against other college kids, was that an eye opener? Oh, well, it was, a, the big eye opener was that, you know, cause I mean, no offense, but Eagle High, your Eagle High School or Idaho football in general is not really, you know, if there was a ranking of the 50 states, we're not even yeah. in the top 25 probably. Right. And so, yeah, that was the big thing is uh, our college actually recruited a lot and got a lot of second tier athletes from Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And that was the big one is just the tenacity and just, n- I would, aggression would be the word I would use just of play they used. It was just no holds barred. It's like, yeah, I'm your teammate, but I'm going to kick your ass if I can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so it, that was a really eye opening experience to see, like, you know, you, you know, you come from a school and you're like, hey, I was one of the top five athletes feeling pretty good about myself. Mm-hmm. But then you start doing the math, you know, hey, there's, you know, 10,000 high schools in America. So that's 50,000 top athletes. And now you got to play against them and maybe top athlete here versus there. Those are. There yeah. are a million high, yeah, yeah, a million high school athlete football players in the United States. Yeah. So it's highly competitive and it's hard to keep your position. And the biggest thing you want to do is you do want to strength train. You want to get as much money, maximize the money you can through scholarships. Um, a lot of people don't understand the whole scholarship process, which is scary to me because from my end of it, I've seen kids get recruited to certain schools and there is no money they're giving them. A couple thousand dollars is not a lot. And especially if there's a whole lot left. And I, so that concerns me. And then parents feel obligated to try to make it work. And so then the family is in hardship because they're paying twice what they need to pay when they could be at another college. Yeah, and I, and I experienced this too when I went to colleges. There were flat out kids that had never been in a weight room, or they said they had been, but the way they moved, either the coaching was extremely poor, or you know this was their first exposure. And that's really something that's just in general right now. The fitness world is kind of stirring quite a bit, mm-hmm. in the sense of it's kind of started more at the you know general population, but now not just you know it used to be just hey the the top programs, Alabama, Nebraska, these big schools, you know, and these amazing strength coaches. And now it's like, well, hey, now the women's basketball needs to strength coach, the golf team, Mm -hmm. volleyball, baseball, lacrosse. And they're really realizing that strength as a general characteristic can enhance any sport if it's applied properly. So having stronger legs is just as appropriate for a basketball player as it is for a golfer. Yeah. There's just different applications in the field of play. And so it's really a one size fits all characteristic in the sense that everyone needs it. Mm -hmm. It's just that not everyone sees that equal value in it. And I think that's beginning to change. There's a lot of kind of big names in the strength world that are trying to get, you know, one people fairly compensated. Uh, That's a big issue in the strength and conditioning world and more at the collegiate level. But also to bring attention that, hey, it's not just the football team anymore. It's 
strength is for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And if your core is set, you're going to have fewer injuries, fewer injuries, few, you know, it just the whole thing. I, I, and I, I just know from, I, I, I wasn't even looking at, at that end of it. I was just more concerned with the kids and their grades. And, and you know, not everybody is going to be in the top of their class. Mm -hmm. They aren't. But there are opportunities to be above the halfway point and to take strategic classes. So my son, I would call, like myself, I was an average high school student. Uh, but we made sure his transcript had everything on it that was appealing to private schools. So he had the four Englishes, four math, four science, four social studies, and two languages, you know, two years of language because nothing else could fit in. Um, and it was important. And that, that helped in the world of, and you have to be above a certain grade point average for colleges to be able to give you money. And that was important as well as try to make it as easy as possible for the coaches. But then I started seeing kids getting career ending injuries. And I thought, what the heck is going on? And so just through association, and I've always been athletic, I played racquetball and, and I recognized that there were that, oh, strength coaching and, and not everybody is, does it well. So I have been associated with other people who do what you do, and I have seen the value, and the kids don't get hurt. And if they do get hurt, they recover quickly. That's, so, that's the biggest one is if they are injured, they have a quicker turnaround. Yeah, and that's what you need, yeah. and that's what you want. So again, tell people where you are. How can they get a hold of you? Um, what Do you have specific hours or... What do, you, what do you do for, how do you get people, how can people reach out to you? Yeah, so I'm on 2483 East Fairview Avenue. I have both options. So I have set class hours, Okay. Um, general population. So early a.m., I have 5.30 and 6.30 a.m., 9.30 a.m. Yeah. And then I have two uh, afternoon options, 4 and 5 p.m. Also right now, I mean, it's just, it's already started, but I'm running a volleyball class. And then the rest of my schedule really is filled in either personal training. If someone wants to work one-on-one -on -one and wants, you know, a directed program mm -hmm. or during the summer, like right now, I have a couple hours where I'm training some volleyball girls um, and trying to kind of fill out the schedule with uh, getting those specific needs or getting with different athletic populations. And then... You know, just like everyone else, I'm on the internet, so treasurevalleystrength.com mm -hmm. or at treasurevalleystrength on Instagram. Okay. And so anybody can walk in. Mm -hmm. And so we'll attach, we'll put in our script. You'll find his links, and that will be great. We're also going to put him up on our YouTube channel. And we're actually going to come visit anyway. We're going to come and do like an on-site visit and do okay. some filming on there because we like to torture people. But it's really good to know. I mean, I know that um, you want to... I like certain looks in gyms. And because I've traveled and lived in different areas, I um, some of them are scary. So we're going to show you how inviting <laughs> Seth has a great... Um, There's no lighting in the gym, though, so... As far I'm just as oh, it's just, <laughs> just a dungeon. Yeah, you're gonna see, but that's, <laughs> I know what you mean, though. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 and especially you know, as a woman, you want you know, you want to feel comfortable, and you don't want to feel like, um, I don't know, you just want to feel like there's going to be other women there. I think that's great that you're working with athletes in groups, and I would encourage any anybody who's a booster club, who's on a booster club, to go talk and see this gym and talk about um, potentially working as a group because I think that's good. I think um, a lot of what the Booster Club does is they are, I mean, they're fantastic. They do a lot of volunteering, but they can use their funds towards people like you. And a lot of them don't realize that they can do that, but there are some really smart moms um, and I'm sure there's smart dads, but I've seen smart moms utilize booster club money to ensure that their athletes are not getting injured. And I think that's really cool. So again, um, I, uh, I invite you to check out his gym and look at his classes. And do you have an introductory class in particular or? 
So usually the way I process people is I do three one-on-one sessions to kind of acquaint with them. And really I'm doing two things. One, I want to screen their movements oh, and see actually what's happening. Um, there's just a lot of dysfunction or just people aren't aware. Mm-hmm. Um, and then two, making people comfortable because most people, you know, female specifically going into the idea of just walking into a weight room is not necessarily something they're just, you know, super comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of like to break it down one-on-one and I found that to be really successful because then there's a base layer of knowledge, understanding, we're getting the movement patterns correctly. Um, But really, I mean, movement is a lifelong pursuit. You're not going to have the perfect squat after one session or 10 sessions. That's something that's going to take kind of a lifelong lifelong pursuit. Um, So just want to get people's feet wet and then that gives them the chance, hey, this is something I like. They continue into my classes. If they're like, Hey, not really my cup of tea, no harm, no foul, and we'll go our separate ways. Good. Okay. So, again, thank you very much, and we shall come visit your gym, hopefully within the next two weeks. So we'll plug it up, and people can see it, and I appreciate you coming. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. Bye.